we are back for part two of our interview with the lovely Dan Hill from Spec Training. Uh, so, Dan, on the 15th of February, which was like two weeks ago, um, DIWA announced that there were going to be some early changes to the RTO standards coming into effect from March. Uh, a bunch of us then jumped into the uh, skills for education sector and were all gas bagging throughout that period, which was hilarious. Um, but I wanted to get your feedback. So there's obviously some, it's enabling people who hold an education degree to be engaged as trainers or assessors, mm. enabling people working towards the CERT 4 or Diploma of TAE to contribute to assessment under supervision, um, enabling broader use of industry experts, um, and then obviously some minor clarifications and amendments to the RTO standards, devil in the detail there. Um, and aligning with recent changes to the FFPs. But obviously those first three points, um, so reflecting new and updated training products from the TAE uh, sent the audience into panic and there was 27,000 questions submitted about mm. the TAE. So, you know, again, I know you and I have both said it, but, you know, do you want to just clarify for everyone, do people need to upgrade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, th there's a couple of things here. Firstly, the uh, the IRC, when they created it, now I know they're no longer the IRC for this particular product, but they very were very clear about the fact that they didn't want people to need to upgrade. There was It was stated in black and white. The standards... Sorry? For good reason. Yeah, yeah. We lost, we lost 30% of our training sector in the mm -hmm. last month. In the last NASA upgrade. Yeah, there, there was an organisation I did a, a um, PD workshop for as a part of a couple of days worth of professional development that they did. They were a, a Queensland not-for-profit in a particular sector and um, and most of their trainers were males over 50, I'd, I'd guess, and uh, they were rolling eyes saying they're, they're going to get out. If they have to do another upgrade, they're quitting. I'm like, okay, okay, <laughs> that's that's your prerogative. Um yeah, but like we discussed in our uh, previous session, the, the word upgrade has is, is got a, um, a bit of a dirty reputation when it doesn't need to. There's only been a couple of upgrades in, in 14 odd years. And in that period of time, the upgrades haven't been substantial. There have been a couple of units here, a gap assessment here. You know, it hasn't been that big uh, of a burden. Uh, and the current one, there is no requirement to upgrade to. So my two cents worth with the changes in the standards are that they are most likely, now it could be proven wrong in two weeks, so let's, <laughs> but most likely they will stick with the 16 as the requirement for entry uh, into uh, the world of accredited training and assessing. So the TAE 16. Um, the 22 will be, uh, it might be mentioned in there simply because it is the current one. It might be mentioned, but it, it might also say something like it is um, not equivalent. What's the word they used? Uh, I think it was just, it was newer superseded products or something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, they didn't use the word superseded. They just, uh, I can't recall the wording, but basically um, it, it's not in re a replacement for um, yeah. as far as needing to upgrade to. In other words, uh, yeah. I, I can't remember the, the wording. I think it's just basically going to be saying if you hold the, the 10 plus the two units, the 16 or the 22, you've met that particular requirement. Yeah, well, that's what it is now. Yeah, so I think what they're going to do is drop the 10 off simply because it's 15 years old by the time the new standards come out. So um, I think they'll drop that off. That's my my bet. Uh, and if they do that, that's fine because most people in the industry who needed it have upgraded to the 16 already anyway. If any RTO yeah. is out there still working with people who only have a 10 uh, and not the two units, uh, then that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, and uh, then we, yeah, the, the gap assessment for the 10 plus those two units to the 16 is a, is a one day program. You know, don't yeah. tell me you haven't got time for a one day program. It's not even a full day by the time you've completed yeah. it. So it, that's pretty simple. And most providers do offer that. So that would get people across the line as far as the requirements go. And I think that's, that's fine. That's good. And then, the um they've been very careful with their wording about what supervision is as well as working alongside so they've said supervision and then they've also said the words working alongside in your view lauren are they the same thing um no so i so my question my question at the session last week was 
um, it says contribute to assessment. And I very clearly asked the question and said, does contribute to assessment evidence mean collecting assessment evidence? Um, so I would be, like, if I'm writing a policy on this, I, my policy is probably going to say something to the effect of um, a trainer can, for example, like a trainer under supervision can, for example, collect um, the theory assessments for the learners. However, they cannot assess for the learners. Like they cannot assess the assessments, right? That has to be signed off. However, in the session, they basically said um, that they could help, they could contribute to the assessment process, but the final sign off would have to be done by a qualified assessor. Now, to me, that gives leeway. Just in my like in my brain, I look at that and go, that's giving people leeway for somebody who's not qualified to actually undertake assessment. And I have reservations about that with RTOs turning around and going, oh, okay, so, you know, so-and-so can do all the assessment and I've just got to have so-and-so do the final sign-off on the unit. Um, I would be wanting, yeah, I think that's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. I like the, I mean, I actually like this. I like the changes because I, I know that in a lot of RTOs that we're, I'm working with at the moment, we are taking people brand new from industry and training them how to do things correctly from scratch and then mm. supporting them through their TAE because it's easier to get somebody from industry and train them properly from day one than it is to try and get a trainer and then, you know, for example, put them through an industry qualification to get their industry, you know, like to get those additional couple of units or something like that. I'd rather take someone who really knows the industry, loves the industry, is passionate about the industry and teach them how to be a good trainer and assessor. Um, and I think that's the way that we build like a better sector. But I think there's going to be a lot of devil in the detail of these standards. And mm. like part of my brain is looking at it going, well, you could technically make an argument for this then, and you could technically make an argument for this then. So it's going to be really interesting to see how it comes out in the wash. Yeah. There was a lot of talk with... Um... Andrew Shea and I have had a few words at the ITECA conference and uh, I think there was the IPM dinner as well. We've had a lot of chats around this uh, topic, including um, the skill sets, but we'll get to that later But um, if we have time. But the, uh, the intent behind the qualification, the in intent is, uh, and the intent behind hopefully what they're doing with the um, standards is that if you're going to work under supervision, that's what that means in the traditional sense of the word supervision. In other words, someone's watching you. Now, yeah. today, depending on the sector, depending on the industry, a lot of uh, training is happening virtually. Right. So can you supervise someone asynchronously? In other words, watch what they do afterwards and provide them feedback. Nothing against that depending on what the work outcomes are or the training outcomes should be. Uh, but as you said, there's going to be uh, arguments, probably not the right word. There's going to be discussions and negotiations around what these mean for specific people in specific circumstances. And that's okay. I, I think to be too prescriptive from the auditors or the regulators point of view, if they are too prescriptive and say, like they did with the TAE saying, you must do this face to face in a room now, that yeah, actually with eight pushes, people. yeah, that pushes people away. That makes it harder yeah. and not harder for the right reason. If yes. they're, they're trying to make it harder to guarantee quality, okay, but that wasn't. And now it's so overly prescriptive makes it harder, but not necessarily for the right reason. So I'm okay with some leeway there, but as long as you know the regulator does do its job or their job, if you include um, BRQA and uh, TAC as well, if they do their job to actually make sure that training organizations are focused on the quality of the outcomes for the students, which is honestly why we're here, if they're yeah. focusing on that, then they should be able to say, oh, I can see where you've you've used a industry expert, for instance, to watch them on a mine site because you couldn't fly out there to do it. And then you yeah. collect all the evidence and you've then made the judgment based on what that, that feedback from that expert is. Great. Great. Yeah. That's good. That's how it's probably supposed to work. Um, and same with the trades as well. Being on site on a on a construction site isn't something that a lot of trainers have the time to do. 
um, or the ability to do. So, you know, <laughs> honestly, some of the WHS hoops have got to jump through just to turn up on site, make it prohibitive in, in a lot of cases. So very much the case i mean like at the moment we're writing um we're writing for you know the health the healthcare system you know mm. and a lot of the units that we're writing for there you know what you're talking about ensuring cultural safety you're talking about you know ensuring patient privacy is met and things like that it's it's really not appropriate you know when you're doing a mental health assessment to have an, an assessor sitting in there observing what's going on do you know what i mean no. so yeah, exactly. there's a whole range of circumstances you know from health and safety to hygiene to privacy to cultural safety where you know adjustments need to be made to ensure that you know that things are happening right it's it's very different having a supervisor who works for the organisation being in a place observing a skill um, being undertaken than it is having somebody external to the organisation. And I think as privacy laws in particular um, and the focus on cultural safety increases, those are some of the things that, you know, do present quite serious challenges when it mm. comes to, like, collecting evidence in a, in a fair, valid, you know, sufficient sort of a manner. Yeah, so Sorry. if you go back to that wording that they talk about working alongside, that is problematic to me. They, if they either say supervisory or not, if they say working alongside, that sounds more like they have to be attached at the hip and watching. Um, so I think they yeah, need I to look the at that way. I think alongside to mean like, you know, like in engagement with, whereas I took supervisory to mean more like I am physically supervising mm. you. So that's interesting yeah. that you and I took... But again, this is where my my hope with the standards is that we are going to kind of get, you know, we're going to get a supporting document with like all of these big keywords that everyone's picking up on mm. alongside with a big word that they picked up on at the meeting last week, um, you know, contri contribute, you know, like what, what do all of these things mean? And that within the explanatory guide that I know yeah. they're working on at the moment, that a lot of that sort of stuff does come out in the wash with examples and, you know, here's what this looks like in best practice and things like that. So mm. it will be interesting. What are your, I'm interested, what are your thoughts on enabling people who hold an education degree oh, to be yeah. engaged as trainers or assessors? Yeah, I've got no problem with that. I remember the very first TAE I ever uh, delivered, ever, uh, was uh, I had a, a teacher in her 50s at the time um and uh she was actually really engaged uh but i have had you know the the, the phone calls from people saying oh, i've been teaching for 20 years why the hell do i need this that's probably more common um but when people who have had that experience in secondary or primary teaching come along to the vet sector and they see how different it is uh and i mean that because i mean i I go the other way. Like I, my son is is almost a qualified teacher now. I've got a lot of friends who are, but you know I haven't been in that um, sector either. So I can't I can't talk from both sides, but I can share what I've uh, I've been told by both sides. And there are significant enough differences to warrant going and doing some sort of update. In other words, figuring out why adults are a little bit different when you when you're planning your sessions. Um, why you need to uh, spend a bit more time listening to people's experiences uh, to respect them as opposed to children who don't necessarily have a host of experiences and therefore you can tell them more. Um, there's a lot of that. Um, but these are nuanced things. And then there's just the understanding the industry. So, you know, what what does the sector look like? How do we get through audits? <laughs> how, do, how do we actually keep compliant and all these sorts of things, which are the necessities. So I think the assessor skill set now, which is interesting, so that, as a new skill set, by the way, has, I think the, um, can I, um, I'm going to forget for a second. It doesn't have just the assessment units like it used to. Um, excuse me a second while I quickly look this up. T-A-S-S, used to be that. And now it's a 19. Uh, okay, yeah, so it's got the, the DES unit in there. So use nationally recognized training products. Um, so the old one didn't. The old one just had the assessor units. Now this one has, you know, you've got to learn about, nationally recognized training products because teachers work on a state-by-state -state education system that has its curriculum that's not necessarily nationally aligned. Um, it has some areas where it is, but generally speaking, it's not. So we aren't like that. We do have a national requirement to meet these standards. So that's good for them to know. 
Uh, and it's a quick skill set to get through. So that how you assess competence as opposed to just, you know, um, using the normative scale that you would normally in schools. So now you've got a competency-based scale of yes or no. <laughs> so these are some simple things um, and they can get across the line with those three units in three to four days, depending on the training organization running it. I think that's great. And then let them yeah. loose because they are capable of standing in front of other humans teaching yeah content and then it's just a case of you know do you have your content knowledge as well <laughs> you know yeah. you, you've obviously got to keep up to speed on but that you as well. generally the bigger problem in certainly like in like the, the vet and school sector and things like that is, is more the matter of how you're maintaining your industry competencies and currencies as opposed to you know how are you maintaining your vet competencies and currencies so um yeah i think the um the uh, vet in school stuff is really interesting. That's what the whole reason they did it really is for the vet in schools teachers. But I can tell you that there are a lot of teachers who are leaving schools and then trying to work in the vocational sector. So it's also going to apply to them. And I think the assessor skill set is going to be more applicable for them. But that um, uh, SS000024, so the vet delivered in school uh, to school students, teacher enhancement skill set, the worst name ever. Because <laughs> who's going to remember that? Um, I think it's accurate. Oh man, that's that's a lot in that. Uh, it, it's it's very descriptive, but so it's got the PDD unit in it, so it's working effectively in the sector. It's about using training products, assessing competence, but then it's got to design and develop plans for vocational training in there, and then participate in assessment. Interesting little mix of units, to be honest with you. Not sure I completely agree with them, but I think um, some schools are going to want their teachers to have this particular skill set, especially now that it's kind of been raised in the standards to come, um, for better or worse. So it's five that's units. That's a better option than doing your, your full TAE for a lot it's of teachers. It's still a better option, yeah. It's still a better yeah. option than doing a full TAE because a lot of that they, they will not use, especially when it comes to the actual training skills or the, the teaching skills because they've got that in the bag, generally speaking. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, I don't... I don't dislike it and i think that the purpose of the design developed plans for vocational training is, is more around uh traineeships and apprenticeships i might be guessing there but if they do have anything to do with that then they'll need to know why uh well, so know, a lot of the trainers though do like i know when we work with because i work with a with an rto that does a lot of auspice arrangements the documents we get from trainers are we get you know we give them like a template tag and we get them to adjust and, and adapt the tag to make sure that it you know so that we know what's actually happening throughout the year we get them to do their trainer matrix, um, you know, and we obviously get them to participate in validation and things like that. So maybe the design and develop component comes from the fact that like, okay, well, how am I actually going to run my course? You know, like my one year, my mm. two year course and run out my units. And, you know, I'm, there, there is a lack of understanding about training products and how to put together a training. <laughs> so, yeah. Sort of that yeah. One, sort of that one. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and again, so we Sorry. will come back very shortly, if that's cool with you, for part three, guys. Um, as I said, if you guys want to follow Dan, all of his information will be below. You can also go on to the SPEC training website, which is www.spectraining.edu.au. Uh, all of those details will be below. Dan and I will be back for part three of our conversation in just a few minutes. Thank you very much, Dan. And guys, like, follow, subscribe to all of those things. Feel free to disagree with us, but just so respectfully, and you can do it out in the comment section. Thanks very much.